Augusta, are you ready to rock? All right. You wanted the best, but they got stuck in Florida, so you got me. So, <laughs> uh, so hopefully you're in the right place by saboteurs and scoundrels. Again, my name is Brian Contos. A little background. I've been in cybersecurity way too long, about 25 years. Uh, I've been building companies most of my career. I started with DISA and then later Bell Labs. I lived in Brazil for a couple years. But then just started building startups. Riptech, ArcSight, Imperva, Solar Networks, Veridin. A couple IPOs, a couple acquisitions. I wrote a couple books. Uh, my last book was with the director of the NSA. And then I recently did a documentary for HBO on cyber warfare with General Michael Hayden. So I've been doing this for a little while. So I've learned a lot of ways of not to do things. Uh, certainly lots of great lessons learned. But this presentation is really about XIoT, or what we sometimes call extended IoT. Now, XIoT is really three general categories. The first one, I think most of you are familiar with, it's enterprise IoT, or enterprise Internet of Things. Printers, KVM switches, lights out management, um, HVAC systems, security cameras, uh, UPS, racks, things of this nature. Um, the other portion are OT, and there's been a couple talks on OT today, but SCADA devices, industrial control systems, PLCs, that genre, things that are digital equipment that controls physics, so temperature, flow, mixtures, volume, things of this nature. The third one are network devices. These are specific to switches and routers, network attached storage, uh, load balancers, wireless access points, and so on. So collectively, these groups have a few things in common. The first one is they're purpose-built hardware and firmware. So they might be just as powerful as a laptop, or in some cases, even more powerful, but they have a very finite use case. The other portion is they're network connected. There's some OT devices that are actually not network connected, and there's some IOTs that actually aren't as well. But in this conversation, we're talking about things that are network connected. It's usually TCP IP, but it could be Modbus, DNP3, other, pro uh, other protocols, et cetera. And the last thing is, and probably most important for today's conversation, is you can't put any kind of endpoint security on these devices. So while they're running Linux or Android or BSD or VxWorks or other relatively common operating systems or real-time operating systems, and they have all the same power and storage and capabilities and ports and protocols as those systems, you can't put any security on them. There's no anti-malware. There's no host-based IDS or IPS. Most of them don't have runtime protection. They're just there, and they're just vulnerable. So that's kind of a perfect storm for attackers, hence this whole presentation. So I think most of you are probably familiar with Shodan. If you're not, it's just like doing a Google search to show me what kind of devices are internet accessible within certain categories. So I did a very scientific study, and I typed in words like camera, UPS, voice over IP, just to see what might come up in these. But look at cameras. There's almost 5 million cameras. And there's probably a percentage of these that are honeypots, but even if it's 5%, which is probably less than that. But look at UPSs, uninterrupted power supplies. What would be the use case of having your UPS internet accessible? Probably not something that was done on purpose. Uh, quick question to the audience here. What do you think is the most common UPS vendor out there? And I'm sure you've heard the name before, but a APC. So I did some more scientific research. I said, I wonder how hard it would be to find out what the default username and password is to a APC UPS. Does anybody want to hazard to guess what the default username and password is? Not even that hard. So using this hacker tool called Google, I said default password APC UPS, and it's APC APC in lowercase. Now just to give you uh, some feedback, so my company, Phosphorus, we focus on XIoT stuff. We've been doing this for years and years. We have a bet, and that's we, if we ever find an APC UPS system that does not have the default password, APC, with the default username, APC, will buy everybody in the office a steak dinner. We've been eating a lot of chicken. Nobody ever changes these. So you've got about 13,000 plus devices that are internet accessible, which are probably pretty important, and they probably have important things plugged into them, and there's about a 99.99% chance the username and passwords, APC, APC. 
So use that however you like. Uh, so here are some stories about these devices. Has anybody heard of a Russian XIOT hacking tool called Fronten? Okay, this is kind of a unique tool. So the Russian FSB had a consulting group build an XIOT hacking tool for them, specifically to do the following. Find XIOT devices, like we just did with Showdown, compromise those devices, control those devices, use those devices then to attack IT assets in those environments, and then exfiltrate sensitive data. It's actually an extremely, extremely powerful tool. Unfortunately for the Russian FSB, it got stolen by the Digital Revolution Hacking Group that said this is way too powerful for one nation to have. So if you go to your favorite torrents and other locations where you like to download malware and hacking tools, and if you can read Russian, this is a really, really powerful tool that you can leverage today. And by the way, it's not just Russia that builds tools like this. Everyone's building tools like this now, because hacking XIOT is the, the new new, and we'll, we'll talk about why that is. China takes a little bit of a different approach to this. China says, well, that seems like a lot of work to hack something after the fact. Why don't we just ship it with the malware already installed? We'll just skip the middleman. It's a huge time saver. It's very efficient. It's very effective. So the US House of Representatives actually passed a bill banning certain vendors, things like ZTE, Huawei, uh, Hikvision, which is one of my favorite. That's a, a camera up there. It actually ships with the malware already installed. Um, it, it's, it's pretty interesting how blatant it is as well. So essentially, when the camera is recording audio and video, there's a light that's green. And if you say, hey, camera, stop recording audio and video, it says, OK, I'm going to turn that green light to red. But guess what? It's still recording audio and video, and it's still streaming that information back to a location that eventually makes its way back to China, where they're doing temporal analysis, volumetric analysis, pattern discovery, anomaly detection to correlate massive amounts of data. So you can think of some of these cameras are probably in very sensitive areas, financial services, critical infrastructure, boardrooms, things like this. So that's the Hick vision. And it's not to slam this particular company. I'm sure they have some products that are very good that aren't laden with malware, but they happen to be so high profile that they are banned by the US in government use and with government contractors, yet we see them all the time. And fun fact, the most common camera on Amazon the last few years with the highest number of reviews came preloaded with malware as well. So this is a very common occurrence for security cameras. Now, this Hikvision camera, something else just happened very recently. So August 23rd this year, it was announced that there was over 80,000 exploitable Hikvision cameras. And that number actually, I think, is way lower, probably by an order of magnitude. But a patch came out for this exploit back in September 2021. It doesn't surprise me that it wasn't applied, though, because nobody ever patches these devices. When these devices get deployed, they're pretty much the same way as day one as they are, you know, year 20, when they get ripped out of the office building. So no one's fixing these. So it's kind of a sad state of affair for Hikvision that they ship with malware. And if that's not good enough for you, here's a bunch of exploits you can use against it as well. It's not very fair, but I guess life's not fair. It's not fair that carbs make you fat, but I'm Italian, I love pasta, and there you go. So who's heard of Mirai, the Mirai botnet? Quite a few of you. This is like the poster child for XIOT attacks. This is way back in 2016, which in the XIOT world is ancient history. But this is pretty interesting. So the attackers started off by searching for cameras, just like we did with Shodan. Further, they refined the search to say, hey, is Telnet running? So port 23. OK, I found a camera. It's got Telnet open. Third thing, does it have the default password? Well, most of them do. And if it doesn't, let's try one of about eight or 10 different password combinations. And sure enough, that gave this botnet enough power to take down Sony, Reddit, Netflix, Twitter, PayPal, GitHub, major telecoms. It's just a few security cameras. It had more aggregate processing power and bandwidth than Google and Amazon combined. So it just goes to show you how powerful some of these botnets are. But the plot thickens. In the XIOT world, there's a lot of shared libraries, and there's a lot of white labeling, which means I have a security camera, and it's got this build, but hey, this guy over here is building a printer, and he doesn't want to use all his original code, so he's got to grab this shared library, this bit of white labeling, this and that. 
So now this printer has the exact same vulnerabilities. It's running Telnet. It's running default passwords as the camera. And so is this AV equipment. And so is this voice over IP phone. So now you're seeing that this spreads to multiple XIoT devices. And this is indicative of this space all the time. Because a lot of these companies aren't tech companies that build this equipment. Some of them are, some of them aren't. HP, they build printers, they're a technical, technical company. There's agricultural companies, there's companies that focus on healthcare and other things. This isn't their daytime job. So they bring in contractors, consultants that don't have any type of security development life cycle. They've never heard of a SDLC. They just want to make the blinky lights blink, make everything work, and then they move on to the next job. So we go into organizations today, and again, this is back in 2016, that their devices are still vulnerable to Mirai. In fact, we still see organizations today that their devices have already been infected by Mirai, and they're still being controlled. But as long as they're printing, or the voice over IP phone's working, or the security camera's doing its thing, no one's paying a lot of attention. Now, this was kind of the first generation of XIoT attacks, which were opportunistic. Let me just add you to my botnet. And then with that botnet, I'll do black hat search engine optimization, phishing attacks, malware distribution, DDoS, so on and so forth. But this has evolved. The next generation is lateral movement, and this is the big one. So when I think of the, the whole world of XIoT attacks, it's really three areas. It's that opportunistic botnet stuff. It's using XIoT to attack IT assets, which we're going to talk about here. And it's that physical world stuff we talked about, like spying, unlocking doors, shutting down the power, things of this nature. Those are the three big categories. But this one's called Quiet Exit, and this was released by Mandiant earlier this year. So the way this worked is the attackers got in through traditional phishing techniques on IT assets like a laptop, through social media, through messaging, through email. I'm going to go ahead and get some malware on your laptop. But I know you've got network security and application security and endpoint security and encryption and all these things you're spending all this money on, so I don't want to stay there. I want to quickly look for XIoT devices that you're not paying attention to. And in this particular case, they were looking for network attached storage, security cameras, load balancers, wireless access points, voice over IP phones, things like this. Again, on the network side, it's all BSD. And on the IoT side that they were looking at, it was all pretty much Linux and a little bit of Android. So they weren't like crazy unknown operating systems. So they got access to these devices, and once they were there, they installed uh, DropBear, which is just a reverse SSH tunnel. So once that was recompiled to be loaded on these network devices or these IoT devices, they could control them remotely. So I got in through IT, I pivoted to XIoT, and now I can control that XIoT device. Once there, they were making AP call, API calls to a local exchange server and Office 365 in the cloud. They started extracting emails, email attachments, all the messages going back and forth, especially for executives, security teams, M&A groups, so on and so forth. The reason they moved here was because they could evade detection and they could avoid any type of sort of security tools that might have been in place had they looked at an IT perspective. So I'm going to maintain that persistence, I'm going to evade detection, and I'm going to continue to make these calls and exfiltrate data. In almost every case, they were there for over 18 months. Over 18 months of making API calls and grabbing every single organizational email. And they did it from some XIoT devices. And the fun part is, why compromise one XIoT device when you could compromise thousands? It gives you a much better uh, way to maintain that persistence in your network. So here's a recent takedown. This was a Russian botnet called RSOX. And what was really interesting about this, in fact, the only really interesting thing about it, it was such a successful botnet, actually, and it was so uh, well-constructed that they were renting it out for about $30 a day so people could use it for DDoS attacks. For $100 a day, you could rent it out, and you had full 24 by 7 technical support as well. So they were running, running this like a real company. But what I think is interesting about this one is the primary target were industrial control systems, which were mostly real-time operating systems. Now, industrial control systems sometimes are Linux, sometimes there's Windows, but usually VX works and other things of this nature. But they didn't do it so they could blow something up or you know, change voltage on something or, or screw up some mixture in a batch manufacturing plant. They just did it to add it to a bot. And there were some network devices, there were some IoT devices, but it was mostly industrial control systems, but it was very, very powerful. Um, that takedown, as you know, most takedowns, the way they work, think of it like DNS. 
you know, you've got all these subsections reporting finally up to a master. If you can take that out, you can kind of take the botnet down, at least for a few weeks until they rebuild someplace else. Siemens had an attack that came out pretty recently with a horrible name, the S7 plus crash attack. Uh, this kind of tells you how easy some of these attacks are on the industrial control system side. So essentially think of a device like this that controls temperature. And in, in the OT world, we call these set points. So the temperature can go as low as 70 degrees Fahrenheit and as high as 80 degrees Fahrenheit. If it goes lower or higher, I'm gonna send an alarm to a SCADA device, it's gonna alert me something bad has happened. Okay, so it's there, so I, let's say I log in and I change it and I say, hey, I wanna increase the temperature now to 120 degrees, which should be way past that point. But as soon as I do that, I start sending packets and I can use something as simple as Netcat to send a packet on TCP to port 102. By simply sending packets on port 102 to this Siemens device, it does a DOS attack. It can't communicate. It says, oh, something bad's happening. The temperature's going way over the point it should be going on my set point, but I can't tell anybody because somebody sent me a packet on port 102 and I'm still trying to figure out what that thing means because I wasn't designed to understand that. So what's important about this particular attack was Siemens came out and says, look guys, we have some great security fixes for you. The first thing is patch your system. So we think you should update your firmware. The second one is enable password control. A lot of these devices don't even come with password control enabled. That's a checkbox. Third thing, once you do that, set a password. And then the fourth thing is turn off services you don't need, like clear text, protoc uh, clear text protocols, Bluetooth low, uh, low energy, things of this nature. These are pretty basic things, right? These aren't things that in the IT world that we think of as very groundbreaking. In fact, I like to say this, that XIOT security today is like IT security was in, in 1995. And I made this slide before Coolio, we all know he recently died, so rest in peace, Coolio. But in 1995, that's about when I got started working in IT security. In my very first project, this was at DISA, I had to go around and find all these US robotics modems that were plugged in and nobody was tracking because that was the great evil of the world at that point. Hackers were gonna get in through dial-up modems and, and take over the world and launch nuclear weapons and all that stuff. So I downloaded this tool that ran on DOS called Tone Loke, written by Minor Threat and Mucho Mas. All it was was a war dialer and the PBX guys hated me on all these bases because it would ring every single number sequentially within the entire base, looking for the response of a dial-up modem. And then once I found that modem, I had to figure out does it have an owner, if it doesn't, I put it in a bucket. I had many, many, many buckets filled with these US robotics modems. The next thing I got into in that time frame was there was this tool called Satan. I don't know if any of you ever used it, but it was one of the first vulnerability scanners. It was before ISS's freeware version. I think it stood for Security Administrator Tool for Analyzing Networks. I had it loaded on my son, Pizza Box. I think it was Solaris 2.51 is what I was running. And I was using this for vulnerability scanning and somebody said, hey, we want to install this new thing called a firewall. What's a firewall? Nobody had really talked about it too much at that point. It was all ACLs. So the device that I was doing my vulnerability scanning on, we actually had set up as a firewall because I was the only person that had a workstation that had two NICs so we could have uh, internet facing and an internal facing. So it just goes to show you how basic things were back then. So password management, discovery of your devices, firmware and patch management, these things were in the early, early, early days. It's the same way for XIOT today. For those of you who are just starting to get into cybersecurity, take a serious look at this being the new new, because this will probably carry your career for at least the next two decades. This is what everybody is talking about. This is what all the buzz is now on the dark net. This is where a lot of nation state investments are going right now. Cyber criminals are going after this in a big way. If you're new to this space or you have more time left in this space, consider this as an area of focus. So, we have a lot of interesting research stats that we've discovered over the last five years looking into XIOT. We've looked at millions and millions of devices across all geographies, uh, private sector, public sector, so on and so forth. So here's some interesting stats. What we've discovered is there's roughly three to five XIOT devices per employee for every company. So a company of 10,000 people has roughly between 30 to 50,000 XIOT devices. That's a lot. 
It's a lot more than you'd think. In fact, it's so much more than you'd think that on average, when we go into a company and I say, hey guys, guess how many devices you think you have? If they tell me 50,000, I know in the back of my head, okay, they got about 100,000, because they're always off by 40 to 60%. Because they go, oh, I forgot about all the door locks. Oh, I forgot we had that many security cameras. Oh, I forgot about KVM switches and lights out management. We forget about all these things because no one's ever managed them because there was never a way to, to do it before. So they're just sitting there vulnerable, open, exposed. Now there's a bit of a bell curve to this. Um, law firms have a little bit less than three to five. Uh, retail has quite a bit more. And industrial manufacturing, both batch and discrete, have a lot, lot more. So, but on average, again, three to five devices per employee. Um, so audience participation. Uh, what percentage of XIOT devices do you think operate with default passwords? 95, 60. You're also pessimistic. So, <laughs> 50%, roughly. Now, again, there's a curve to that too. Audio video equipment is closer to about 99. If you have, like we talked about before, an APC UPS system, good luck, right? Now, when we talk about this, also what you find out is when those passwords were changed, maybe they were changed once at the time of implementation because it required a password change. Rotation frequency every 90 days, uh-uh. Complexity, probably a four-digit pin. And length, again, probably a four-digit pin. So not really good password policy because how are you gonna do it? You're gonna send somebody around with a paper clip to reset every single video camera in a casino? Probably not, right? So there was no way to do it at scale. So what percentage of XIOT devices operate with end-of-life firmware? What do you <laughs> 70, okay. 26%. So 26% end-of-life. However, on average, six years old. So imagine trying to operate that smartphone that's sitting in front of all of you right now with an operating system or any app on there that was six years old. It, it probably just wouldn't work, right? but these are the devices that are controlling critical things. And a lot of these devices help manage other devices. UPS, racks, KVM, lights out management, so on and so forth. So this is a big problem. And with old firmware comes vulnerabilities. Now this one, when we started researching it, we had to go through the data a few more times because this is really sad. 68% had CVSS scores, so CVE ratings, you know, one to 10, 10 being the worst, of eight, nine, and 10 almost 70% had eight, nine, or 10, which means a hacker with very little to no skill, in fact, we won't even call him a hacker, we'll just say a person with a laptop, <laughs> that can access the device that, for some reason, it doesn't have the default password, oh my gosh, how will I get in? Well, at this level of attack, you can t get administrative access with little to no effort and little to no skill, right? So that's a, that's a huge problem. If I told you this was on your IT assets today, you'd get up and go fix this right away. This is earth shattering. But again, these are Linux devices. These are Android devices. These are BSD devices. They're being compromised. They're being taken over. The only difference is we're not monitoring them. We're not protecting them like we used to, or like we should be. So who are the biggest offenders? This is fun. So we went through, and there, there's actually a very large list we have that are the biggest offenders. I can't spend the whole presentation talking about it, so I limited it just to a handful. But um, We'll start off with this one, KVM, so keyboard, video, mouse. So KVM switches suck, and this is why. You can have a KVM switch, and I think most of you are familiar, but if you're not, think of a rack with a KVM switch, one mouse, one keyboard, one monitor, plugged into a dozen, two dozen, three dozen servers, okay? It's, it's that simple. The problem is a lot of these guys are running Ubuntu version 10, which is about a decade old. I guess you find something that works and you just stick with it. Um, the issue with this is that's filled with vulnerabilities, but you don't need to really worry about that because it's always a default password. Nobody ever changes the passwords on their KVM switches. So if you can get access to the KVM switch, you have direct access to the servers it's connected to without worrying about all the other pesky details. So this is a really, really powerful capability. So if you can get access to the KVM switch, you can access everything else. Next one, help me out here. Lights out management controls suck. And this is why they suck. So lights out management's actually even more powerful than KVM. They're usually installed into the back of your most critical devices. You might have heard terms like um, IPMI, ILO, IDRAC. These are just little Linux servers. That's all they are. 
little Linux servers that are connected to the network that allow you to do things like turn the power on and off. You can change network settings. You can open up a shell. You can spawn a virtual terminal. You can upload software. So you have very rich capabilities. People always forget that these things are there. And this is one of the areas that we say, guess how many devices that you have that are connected that we can discover? Oh, we forgot all about our lights out management devices. Is that really a problem? It's a huge problem, right? So if you're not tracking these devices, it's really opening you up. Okay, server cabinets and racks suck. And this is why. Just like you, so these things have uh, cable management. They have tamper management. They have UPS and power supply capability, which means that if I'm gonna reboot this device because I do a firmware update, it means everything connected to that is gonna have to be power cycled as well, which means nobody ever does it. These things, once they're installed, they're their default configuration, which leaves them vulnerable and everything that's within those devices is vulnerable as well. So this is one that people really often look over. So I like to call these devices that manage other devices, the KVM switches, the lights out, the server cabinets and racks. Okay, physical access controllers suck. So this, now you guys are getting it. So this is the thing. We, we went into a financial services organization and said, hey, let's, let's find out what kind of XIOT devices you have. Oh, we see you have a lot of digital door locks. In fact, you had 6,400 of them. Within about, I want to say 10 seconds, but it was probably closer to five, but we'll go ahead and say 10. We were able to show them how we could lock and unlock any doors in the building at will with no hacking required, including things like the front door, which is probably a pretty big deal. Um, and they said, wow, that's really a problem that we have all these digital door locks that no one's actually paying attention to. I believe these guys were all running uh, Linux as well. There's a very popular company called Nordic Security that ships with uh, level 9.8 out of 10 and level 10 out of 10 vulnerabilities in their default systems. And it's not to say this is a bad company, it's just again to explain to you there is no security development life cycle for many of these companies. They're not looking at this from a cyber perspective at all. They only look at this as a network device that's there but it's doing a physical thing so we're not really doing any cyber security checking on these devices. So big, big vulnerabilities when it comes to door locks and this could be CAC, Right, this could be badge readers, this could be uh, digital um, keypads, anything of that nature. Okay, printers suck. Printers suck primarily because they're super promiscuous. Oh, Brian, what do you mean they're super promiscuous? Well, I'll tell you. They want to connect and talk to you on every single port and protocol possible because they want to be easy to use. They're wired. They're wired list. They've got Talent Open, SSH, HTTP, HTTPS, and everything else in between. They want to be easy to use. The problem with these guys is most of them ship with about an 80 gig hard drive, the enterprise ones. By today's standards, not really big, not really small, but it's pretty large. They're pretty easy to get access to. Passwords are usually, again, default, and if they're not default passwords, there's a lot of vulnerabilities that you can compromise. Once you get onto these printers, here's the fun part. You can start looking for other IT devices on that network to start attacking and exfiltrate data. So we were working with one customer it was a major hotel chain. They had about 60,000 printers across their hotel chain. They had about 2,000 of them had been compromised. What was happening is they were on these printers, these attackers, they had their malware on there. It was going out, it was enumerating shares, it was grabbing sensitive data off networks, it was sniffing traffic, it was pulling that down onto the server, and then it was exfiltrating over ICMP. Has anybody here ever done ICMP data exfil? So when you do it over ICMP, it's low and slow. So it's like I have a bag of rice, and I have an empty box, and I take one grain at a time, and I stick it in the box. It's very monotonous, but it also flies under the radar. And ICMP Echo Request 3 is always allowed out because someone on the network administration team opened it up because they wanted to ping something and do a test, and they forgot to turn it off. Nobody talked to security, so it's up and open for all times forever. That happens all the time. Attackers know that. So they see if I can get onto your device, I can steal sensitive data, I compress it, and I exfiltrate it over ICMP, and nobody will detect this thing. So it's a great, great way to exfiltrate data. And these devices are always vulnerable. And the biggest part of it is, is there's a lot of them. Organizations have tons and tons and tons of printers. Okay, voice over IP phones and video conference systems suck. Now, here's something fun. So this voice over IP phone, not the one pictured here, because not calling anybody out, but there was a voice over IP phone that shipped with port 22 SSH enabled, completely undocumented. 
So much so that the vendor didn't even realize they had port 22 enabled and running on their phone. We talk about shared libraries, white labeling, all the way down to not even knowing what ports you're running on the device that you're selling to people. We see a lot of these video conference systems as well. We talked about spying before. A lot of these will be in executive boardrooms. They're always on, even when you think they're off, and they're always streaming that data back. These are very, very powerful exploits. Most of these guys are Android um, that operate on these systems, by the way. So out of all the systems we've talked about, which one do you think absolutely sucks the most? What XIOT device do you think is the number one worst offender? Cameras. Okay. Yep, cameras, you're right. Security cameras suck the most, and this is why. Because when you go into an organization, you tell them how vulnerable their security cameras are, it's kind of like the end of Spider-Man, where they're all pointing at each other. <laughs> Who's supposed to be securing this? Well, it's facilities, right? No, it's not us, it's, it's IT. No, 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 it's the network team, uh-uh. It's the security, no, it's a third-party vendor. Nobody wants to take responsibility, why would you? We were working with a casino, and these numbers are staggering when you think about, when you think about it, it makes sense. They had over 50,000 security cameras, 50,000. It's just incredible, right? Um, all their cameras were compromised, and they're all being, they're all crypto jacked, so they're all being used for mining crypto. Well, they're very powerful. Most of these cameras were really high-end cameras, much more powerful than our laptops, right? Um, and they're all running Linux. I think maybe BusyBox and some other things, but mostly Linux. Uh, and on these cameras, they were doing crypto mining. Guess how they detected that they were hacked? Ah, power bill, that's correct. So casinos, I'm guessing, have pretty high power bills to begin with. Their power bill increased by 1,000%. <laughs> so that's an anomaly. Um, <laughs> uh, I would love to say Splunk and some correlation rule or some, I, no, it was the, the person that managed the power bill said, hey, what, what happened, right? Um, and there was actually another case at, at a different casino where they had a um, XIOT thermometer in a fish tank, just a thermometer in a fish tank that was accessed by some attackers. They used that to jump into the database that they keep for all their high rollers, all their whales. So it had personal information, it had financial information, it had travel details, it had a lot of very sensitive information, extremely high net worth individuals, all from a saltwater fish tank thermometer, right? So on the security cameras, again, the interesting thing is they can be used for those physical attacks to spy on you. They can be used to add to a botnet. They can be used for crypto jacking and things of this nature. And because of their, the fact that there's so many of these devices and they're so vulnerable, and you saw in that early showdown search how many of those are internet accessible, they're a massive target. Now, again, you don't need to be internet accessible. Most of these attacks are getting in through traditional means through IT, then attacking XIOT, to maintain persistence and avoid detection. That's what you have to think about. These are just other IT tools that are being used to attack the rest of your IT environment. So beyond, we've talked a lot about enterprise, a little bit of, of industrial, but this maps to the military as well. There's a lot of uh, internet of battlefield things uh, on soldiers, on aircraft, on um, terrestrial vehicles. This stuff is everywhere. There's healthcare specific devices as well. Um, smart ships, smart buildings, smart cities all kind of fall into the same category, which is interesting if you think about it. I think the first, the first unofficial XIOT device was a Coke machine, a Coke soda machine. It was put on the ARPANET in like 1988, right? And they tracked how many cans of Coke were still in there. Pretty basic, just a fun little research project. The first official IOT device was uh, announced at Interop and I think it was 1995 and it was a TCP IP toaster, right? Same thing. So in 1995, we had a TCP IP XIOT toaster. Today, in 2022, we have complete smart cities. Dublin, Ireland is the world's largest interconnected smart city in the world that is being used kind of as the beacon for all other cities that want to be smart cities. Traffic, emergency services, water and sanitation, how people are moving, healthcare, everything is interconnected. And this is the way the model's moving. Um, after this, I'm actually flying to London for a week and then Dubai for a week. And about 50% of the time I'm there, it's about how they're moving to a smart city design. So everybody's embracing this. And think about that with all the stats and figures and crazy stuff that we just talked about before. 
stuff starts to get pretty real really fast, right? Because we didn't have to really deal with this in 1995 with IT, but we're certainly dealing with this now with XIoT. So I don't like to give these talks and just talk about all the kind of bad and just leave it like that. There's, there's ways to address these things. Um, and I don't want to pitch any products, but I do want to talk about a new category of solutions. And at the end, I'll share some various vendors out there that you guys can check out. A lot of them have free versions that you can kick the tires on. These are called Enterprise XIoT Security Platforms. Something completely new. It's not a SIM, it's not a firewall, it's not a vulnerability scanner. It's a completely new genre of products. And some of these companies you may have heard of, some of you may have not. But I'd like to give, give folks some solutions on the other side of these. So. The first big issue with XIoT is discovery. As we talked about before, when we go into an organization, we say, how many devices do you think you have? People are usually off by 40 to 60%. They simply don't know what they have. And again, just like IT was back in 1995, people didn't really have a good idea what devices they had in their network. And there's some issues. If you look at some of the traditional ways of doing discovery, think about a vulnerability scanner, a Tenable, a Qualys, a Rapid7. They're all predicated on 1990s vulnerability scanner technology, which works by sending malformed packets to devices and seeing how those devices respond. Do any of you here work in industrial control system, OT kind of SCADA worlds? So a few of you, you're never gonna let somebody go into your environment and start running a vulnerability scanner because a lot of your devices were built in a vacuum and your TCP IP stack will say, oh, I don't know what that is, so I'm just gonna roll over and die. It will impact availability. In the world of OT, it's all in CIA, confidentiality, integrity, availability. It's all about availability. A little bit of integrity, but almost all availability. So you cannot use those traditional means. And for even enterprise IoT devices, some printers and things like that, it can knock those over as well. So you don't want to use that. Well, if I can't scan, what's my other option? Well, maybe I can sniff. Okay, well sniffing's not bad. It's hard to scale throughout an entire environment because you need a lot of taps and span ports and things like that. It can be very, very ineffective from that approach. The other problem is most of these devices do use encrypted communication. So while you can do discovery, you might not be able to glean the metadata necessary in order to make an empirical decision of what this device actually is. I might be able to say something like, I'm 80% sure you're a printer, or I'm 50% sure you're a voice over IP phone, but heck, you could be an MRI machine, I don't know. So that doesn't really work as well. So then you've got sort of asset discovery tools that work by looking at MAC addresses. So the OUI, the Organizational Unique Identifier, or the first six octets of it anyhow. And they basically say, oh, you're JetDirect. So you must be a printer, right? Not really, JetDirect could actually be tagged to things that aren't printers as well. So there's a whole slew of reasons why old school approaches to discovery simply doesn't work for XIoT. It can either be dangerous or it can be inconclusive. But either way, it's not a very good combination. So the way these enterprise IoT security platforms, and again, I'll, I'll share a couple of these uh, players at the end of the presentation. The way they work is they actually do interrogation. And what's that mean? So think of C-3PO from Star Wars. He could speak like a million languages. One of them was like water evaporators and things like that. You have to be able to speak the language of the devices that they were designed to speak. So they all built these abstraction layers to say, oh, you're a printer. I'm going to talk the way you expect to be spoken to. Oh, you're a PLC device. You're a network attached storage device. This device expects some type of specialized Windows client. This device is SSH. This device is Telnet. This is this. You kind of get the picture. There's thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of ways to do this. It's nuts. But in doing that, you're able to actually interrogate these devices and find out what are you? What firmware? What version? What model number? What are your passwords? What are your ports and protocols? What's the status of your certificates? Things of this nature. Right? So you can actually interrogate these devices and identify what it is empirically. And if you can do that, you can move on to the next stage, which is much more important. But at least now you know empirically what you have in your organization. And you can re-interrogate your environment as often as you need to to kind of build up this list. Is it going to be 100%? Probably not. But it's certainly better than nothing. And it's probably close to about 90 95% in most cases, so it's pretty darn good. And again, the big thing about interrogation is it's safe and it's scalable, right? I've seen this being used in military, I've seen this used in manufacturing, healthcare, financial services, so on. So know what you've got, kind of step one. Now that you know what you've got, you can go to step two, which is remediation, which is really the big thing. 
Because it's one thing to say, hey, look, I found 100,000 devices. And by the way, they've all got default passwords, and they're all vulnerable, and they're all running clear text protocols. So have a good weekend, right? It's nice to say, OK, let's go to step two. So one of the things you want to do in step two is actually fix the firmware and harden. So this has to do with upgrading these devices. So a lot of these devices, as we talked about before, they're really old. They're end-of-life firmware. In some cases, the companies have gone out of business. In some cases, they're you know, six years plus. It's not uncommon to find these devices that have um, firmware that's over a decade old, especially on the operating or on the OT side, where you're looking at things like, um, I have a device that's a PLC that's running a turbine, and I depreciate it over decades like I do this turbine. So it used to be, if I can't fix this, how would I fix XIoT devices in the past? I'd VLAN them. I'd spend a lot of money investing in my switching architecture to put all these devices behind VLANs, which is very expensive. For even a mid-sized company, we could be talking about millions and millions of dollars. In fact, I was working with a company in Atlanta yesterday where I think they were quoted like $5 million for just VLANing technology, which who's going to write the check for that? Nobody. It's ridiculous. And I'm not against VLANs. I don't think VLANs are bad. I just think it's a very expensive way to try to fix something. More importantly, it doesn't fix it. The analogy I like to use is, let's say I'm working on something, I cut my left hand open, and I should really go to the doctor. But instead of that, I'm going to stick a plastic sandwich bag on my hand, and I'm going to wrap it up with duct tape. So now I'm not getting blood on my keyboard or my right hand, but I still have a bloody hand in a bag, which is probably a bad idea, right? Well, that's what a VLAN is. It says, oh, I'm protecting everything else, but just keep this bloody hand over here. <laughs> so you still have vulnerable devices. So if you can upgrade the firmware, if you can patch it, I know, such a novel idea, that takes you a long ways. Well, the problem was, historically, discovery wasn't accurate enough to tell you empirically that I know exactly what this device is, so because of that, now I can upgrade all your printers, or all your voice over IP phones, or all your KVM switches, so on and so forth. But now you can. Now you can actually push those. And this is really cool, actually. You might find out that you've got, let's take a security camera, and it has a log for j vulnerability. I think most of you have heard of Log4j. I think it was, it was the, the big news about six months ago. Well, these XIoT vendors don't move at lightning speed when it comes to creating new firmware. So they go, look, we know we have a Log4j vulnerability, and we're going to have a patch for this in a year. So we're going to get it done really quick for you. But you say, look, I'm on version 5. You're not going to have version 6 for a year. Maybe I want to downgrade to version 4 that didn't have that until that happens to sort of be a compensating control. So now you can actually even downgrade these devices. And during that initial discovery process for these enterprise XIoT security solutions, they can actually tell you, if you're on version 5 and you want to go to version 7, you have to go 5 and 6 to 7 as your upgrade path, or you can go right from 5 to 7. That's a huge, huge time saver to know that. Also, you don't have to hunt down the firmware. The biggest problem for firmware, we've all done it, you're at home, you're like, man, I should probably upgrade my wireless access point or my printer. So I'm going to Google this model number, and I'm going to spend an hour trying to find this firmware, spend another hour trying to figure out how to update it. And probably you, either you do it or you just give up and you decide never to do it again. So we all, we all fall into that. I have a printer next to me at home that I, I have no idea. It's, I'm sure it's already hacked and everyone's spying on me. But if you have the ability now to say, I don't have to go find the firmware, that firmware is all going to be kept in some Google Cloud, cryptologically check some, that's how most of these organizations work, and then I'm going to just say, Upgrade all my HP printers from version 10 to version 11. All my cameras from this to that. All devices in Augusta today, all, all devices in Atlanta tomorrow, that sort of thing. That allows you to really scale. And then you're not falling into the case where you're saying, hey, I'm 50% sure this is a printer, so let's go ahead and do the upgrade of the firmware. And then, oh, zoinks, it was an MRI machine. And people get really mad when you turn a $2 million MRI machine into a $500 bubble jet, right? <laughs> so. It's good to have that empirical knowledge. Furthermore, I want to be able to harden, right? Remember what Siemens said? Enable passwords. Add a password. Patch it. Turn off stuff you don't need. Well, this comes up to turning stuff you don't need. Shut off Telnet, TFTP, FTP, HTTP. Just run HTTPS and SSH. Don't run wireless. Just run wired. Don't run Bluetooth en low energy, et cetera, et cetera. So you can start hardening these devices. The next step is credentials. So now I found my device. I've upgraded my device, I've hardened my device across my 50,000 XIoT devices, now I want to manage credentials. 
Most of these devices work by integrating with tools like PAM, privilege access management tools, CyberArk, HashiCorp, Psychotic. There's commercial versions, free versions, whatever. But they store the actual credentials. Problem, they don't speak to XIoT devices, nor do they want to invest the time and effort to make their devices speak to all these XIoT devices. So what they've done is they said, let's let the enterprise XIoT security platform speak to those XIoT devices, and we'll go ahead and manage the credentials on the back end through APIs. So as you're going through that discovery process, it's automatically enrolling them in the PAM solution. Then every 30, 60, 90 days, it's doing the password rotations on those devices, again, using the XIoT solution as the middleware. Now the cool thing about this is, when you're in this situation, you actually have the knowledge to say, well, this device can only take a four-digit pin. Well, this device can actually take 25 characters, but no special characters. Well, this printer can take everything except a, a backslash or a hash sign. Or this can't do the letter B. We've seen the weirdest password configuration policies that you can ever imagine for these devices. But it takes all that out. And then certs. Almost every single wireless access point we run into has a cert that's like TLS version 1.1 or 1.2. It's self-signed. It's expired. This is very common because there's so many of them. It's hard to manage these things and keep track. Just like you manage the credentials, you can manage the certs. So now I've found my device. I've upgraded the firmware. I've hardened it. I've managed my credentials. And now I'm managing my certs. That's pretty great, actually. That's taken you now on par with what you got in IT. So that's kind of step one, discovery. Step two, remediation. My favorite part is this. So now you've spent all this time fixing everything. So you've spent the last three weeks finding your XIoT devices, upgrading the firmware, adding good passwords, et cetera. And now you want to make sure all that work stays good work in perpetuity. And you're looking for that environmental drift. So everything that's working stays working. And it's a very simple process. I've got 50,000 devices. Those devices are going to be reinterrogated every single day. And oh, this device was in version seven, now it's in version three. Somebody must have walked by with a paper clip and poked the little black dot on the back of the device. Or this device did have a great password, but now it's set back to default. Or I wasn't running Telnet, but now I am running Telnet. So out of 50,000 devices, today I can manage by exception, because here's the five devices I need to look at right now. And it actually allows me to scale. And when something changes, they integrate with things like Slack, Splunk, um, you know, Tanium, Demisto, all the traditional tools that you'd use for ticketing, service now, et cetera, to do that alerting. And then you can report on this data as well. Give me a report that shows me all the devices in my environment right now that are end of life. Show me all the devices that I don't have managed by my PAM solution. Show me all devices that have level 9 and 10 CVEs. Just having that type of visibility gives you so many steps beyond what the bad guys are hoping for. They're hoping you'll be apathetic. They're hoping you'll be passive. That's why Russia and other countries and cyber criminals are investing so heavy. Fronten wasn't developed because they thought there was some hedge use case where it might become handy. Fronten was developed because they knew the whole world was being caught without knowing that this was happening. I guarantee it's happening all day long, always, everywhere. This is the new new. Like I said earlier, if you're thinking about getting into cyber, if you're new to this game, this is an area you really want to start focusing on. So sort of sum up things. By the way, here's a bunch of companies. A phosphorus were one. You can certainly talk to us about Orders, Zingbox, Nozomi, Armis, et cetera. There's a few others as well. But these are all organizations that play in this XIOT world. So some of them just do discovery. Some of them do discovery and remediation. Some of them focus mostly on VLANing, whatever. I don't even want to say one solution is better than the other. But there are definitely things that you should start checking out. And for a lot of you, these might be very new names to you, right? They're not as familiar as Splunk and Tenable and things like that. So get to know these. Get to know these types of companies. Because organizations simply don't know what they have. Because they don't know what they have, they don't know what to fix. And if they knew how to fix them, they can't fix them at scale. And if they were able to fix them at scale, they're not able to monitor them to make sure they stay fixed. So that's kind of the, the net net of these. So if anybody wants to get in touch with me, here's, my, here's all my details. But I think we have a couple minutes. Do we have a couple minutes for Q&A? So I'll go ahead and take a couple questions, and we have some gifts to give away, too. So any questions out there? Uh, yes, sir? Yeah, so there's actually a lot of great 
sort of IoT security conferences. XIoT is a bit of a loaded term because it's this umbrella thing. But check out some of the IoT shows. There's some of these offered through Black Hat and DEF CON. I'm doing one in London called the IoT Science Foundation one next week. So there's a lot of these things coming up. There's a lot of reading on IoT hacking. So these are all things that I think you could take a look at to sort of build up your skill set. Yep, great question. Uh, yes, sir? Uh, there, there probably are some that are best. So one of the things we do for fun in our leisure hours is we go to swap meets and we go on uh, eBay and places like that and we buy a whole bunch of this gear. And I live in San Francisco and I don't know why, but our swap meets are filled with like healthcare XIOT devices, especially like IVs, mobile IV systems. And when we pull those in and we look at what's on those devices, Oftentimes, you'll find network maps of organizations, passwords, all sorts of sensitive details that came out of like a healthcare provider, things like that. So some of that's being reused and resold through Ali. Also, some of those devices that you're getting, again, you get what you pay for, and some of these devices do come with malware pre-shipped. So let me ask a couple questions to give away the gifts. So first, we have this book, Go Hack Yourself. Um, who wants to tell me what XIOT stands for? Oh, who, well, I can only give, I only have one book. So ra someone raised their hand? <laughs> okay, right there. Yes, you got it. And that will be for you when you're ready. And let's see, what was the name, and raise your hand, what was the name of the attack that Mandiant discovered that got in through the phishing attack on IT and then pivoted to XIOT? I, I think it, you were the first one, go ahead. Quiet exit, and you get this uh, wireless adapter deal. Awesome. All right, everybody, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it.